What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. In today's case is one that we have never talked about on the channel, but most of you will know at least something about. There is a Netflix documentary that's coming out literally today on this case. There was a drama series that came up on Netflix recently that so many people have watched and has kind of reignited the interest in this case. And the person, the special guest that's coming on, watched everything, looked into everything, has become kind of obsessed with this case. And it's somebody you guys haven't seen on the podcast yet, a brand new guest. It's not Whitney. But for those of you that follow the YouTube channel, you'll know him as the guy behind the camera, the producer, the manager, the back end guy, John Neiser, is joining us today. And for those of you who don't know John, he was my best friend from high school and college. We were roommates in college. He started working media productions at Florida State, never stopped, opened his own business. That's what he does. And this channel is one of his clients. John, welcome in. Tell us why the Menendez brothers captured your attention. What's up, everybody? Um, so I've been, just real quick, I've been told I have big shoes to fill. Uh, people have people have definitely enjoyed Whitney. And so the pressure is on. She set the bar high as the, as the first official podcast guest. Well, you're in good company because the only people I've ever lived with outside of my immediate family are you and Whitney. So this is this only people I guess that I live with can come on the podcast so far. That'll change next week. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Like you said, this case is really interesting. And for me, when you told me like, hey, I want you to look up a case, um, you know, to talk about, come bring it to the podcast. I want to unpack it with you and that sort of thing. Like this one immediately when I was kind of clicking through Netflix caught my eye. And like you said, you said it exactly right. Like you start watching this drama on Netflix. It's a, it's not a documentary yet. It's a, it's a drama. The one that I watched initially, like you said, the, the documentary I think drops today, but it does capture you and you immediately kind of get involved in the layers and, and uh, the different components to this case. Um, so it's, it's very fascinating. Um, yeah. The, the drama series that came out, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about that are kind of different than my average feelings on a real life case that we discuss when we watch a trial or break down the court documents. I know we're going to kind of talk about that throughout and give our major overarching thematic thoughts at the end. Um, but another thing that's been a big aspect of this case is social media. And, and now it's just kind of blown up on TikTok and everywhere else. Um, what, what have you seen on social media today? Because this is a case from the late 80s, early 90s, where yeah. the world was very different, very different. And that's yeah. going to be a common theme throughout the podcast today is how different this case would be if it happened now versus then. Yeah. What I found also fascinating when I was researching it was this was the first case that Court TV ever covered gavel to gavel. It was kind of the rise. Cable TV is come becoming a bigger thing. And uh, this was like the first quote unquote celebrity trial that people could really get involved in the details from the start to the finish. And so it truly kind of like paved the way for us kind of the, what we know in modern day is like true crime and the following of true crime in pop culture. This case was kind of the first of its kind in that sense. And most people think of OJ as the first one. And what's interesting about this is this case happened twice. I'm not going to jump ahead, but there were two trials on this case. The first one was the one you're talking about, gavel to gavel. That is reportedly the first one. There are some thoughts that maybe some clips of some other trials or whatever made it out on TV. But this case, and then OJ happened right after trial number one. And then trial number two happened right after OJ. And a lot of that had to do with kind of what happened in this case. But we've kind of teased it enough. Let's get into what this case is, what happened, what are the facts, why is this interesting, why are millions of people watching clips of it on TikTok? Explain the Menendez brothers case and the do the drama is called Monsters, just to give you an idea of what people think about these guys. Yeah, so August 20, 1989, Jose and Kitty Menendez were shot in their Beverly Hills home. Their son, Lyle, discovers them, uh, he's 21 at the time, calls 911 claiming someone had killed his parents. Don't kill my parents. Pardon me? Uh, he's got a brother, 18 years old at the time, Eric, uh, and, and cooperates the story. They, they find them. They're immediately distraught. Um, and then, like I said, call the police. Initially. They were executed with shotguns to the face and rest of the body. Multiple shots. Gruesome scene. Yes. Shot in. Literally, they were watching TV in their family room, appear to be eating dessert together, eating dinner together, watching a TV show and just shot 
like you said, with shotgun. Um, so initially the police come investigate. First thought is, so they look into Jose's work. I mean, he works in media. He works with actors and singers and dancers and things like that. He works in the Hollywood world. This is in California. And so he's got a lot of connections to a lot of important people. And they immediately think some important person got mad at him. I think one of the sons even said maybe he was involved with some shady people. Eventually it spins into potentially this was a mob hit. Exactly. Correct. That's that's the initial first theory that the police kind of run with, but it kind of comes up dead ended. And one of the one of the immediate kind of suspicions that, that felt just kind of weird. There was no hard evidence from this, but um, one of the things that kind of raised some eyebrows, so to speak, from people that were investigating the case uh, right after the murder, the boys immediately kind of go on this wild spending spree. There's a trust that they get access to, and I think it was somewhere close to four hundred thousand um, dollars. Actually, sorry, it was more than that because I think they their their um, spending totaled somewhere around seven hundred thousand dollars in total. Uh, but they were using credit cards and they were using business assets and they were getting IOUs because everybody knew they were rich. So it was like just charge it and I'll pay you back when I get access to the money because we know Dad's leaving all the money to us. They were spending every dollar they could get their hands on, basically Rolexes, sports cars business deals, all sorts of stuff that, you know, rich kids who just got access to money would do, right? They were already rich before, but it was daddy's money. Now it's their money. So while the spending spree wasn't hard evidence, it definitely raised suspicions, like you said, um, but they didn't have anything hard on the boys. Although I'm sure some in the police department and the drama series, of course, says some law enforcement officers did suspect the kids, but they didn't uh, dust their hands for gunshot residue at the time. They didn't do an investigation after the crime took place that would at all point anything back to the kids. And that's until Judalon Smith enters the story. And she is the girlfriend, side piece though, because this guy's married, of a psychologist. And this psychologist was working with the Menendez brothers um, as part of some court-appointed deal for some robberies that they got in trouble for in the past. They had to go talk to this uh, psychologist. Was he a psychologist or psychiatrist? I can't remember. A mental health expert. And they confessed to these crimes. And what's wild is, if Judalon Smith had never tipped off the police, there's a really good chance that back in 1990, right, very early on, before technology exploded, before you could be tracked by your cell phones and your cars and there was cameras everywhere and social media and everybody was posting and texting and emailing everything, it was possible they could have completely gotten away with this crime. But Eric, being guilt-ridden, went in, talked to his mental health professional, who told his girlfriend, they record the confessions, she tells the cops, and everything starts spinning out of control. And from that point forward, all of the law enforcement's attention are focused on Eric and Lyle Menendez. The kids, in supposedly part of a very loving and happy family, are now the main targets and defendants in the deaths of their own parents. So quick question. With uh, uh, doctor-patient confidentiality, could he have gone on knowing what had happened and, and not never come forward himself with that information? So, so the interesting part about all of this is so many legal decisions that were made in this case could have been a fork in the road and a turning point. And this is one of them, right? So the confession is to their psychologist and there is a patient doctor relationship, confidentiality and privilege. It would be like if somebody comes into my office and confesses, I shot my mom. Okay. I can't call the cops. I can't tell the cops. I can't get them arrested. Law enforcement and the state attorney's office cannot use my comments on that because it is privileged. So legally, those are inadmissible. But there are ways in which they can become admissible. If he is going to commit another crime, then I can tell the cops he's going to commit another crime. Some people would say certain you know, uh, lawyers or doctors have a duty to tell law enforcement to stop that further crime. And that further crime can be covering up the crime that they've already committed, obstruction of justice, things like that. Or, or if you threaten your doctor, then those statements could potentially become admissible. It's kind of a gray area. It's kind of judicial discretion. But in this case, that is what happened. That the doctor says he started recording these conversations because he thought they were starting to threaten him. And based on those threats, which would be another crime happening in the future, this all became admissible. Now, I'm still not so sure that it that every judge would make the same decision. I think there are some legal arguments where some judges would have said, no, 
even these confessions were not admissible, but you can understand how most judges try to, in the interest of justice, when we know the truth, it's really hard to kick out an admission of a heinous crime like this, of two monsters that committed this heinous act. So in this case, they found that because the Menendez brothers made threats to their therapist, that the uh, patient doctor privilege did not protect these statements and these statements, most of them, there were certain statements that they did actually cut out. They went through, they cut some out, they kept some in, but the most damning confessions were allowed in. And you can imagine that's the star witness. That's the most important evidence in this case. And that changed the entire case. It no longer became who done it. Is it the mafia? Is it somebody with Jose's work? We know who did it. Now it became why, what happened and why did they do it? Wow. So trial begins July 20, 1993. And like so we said earlier, years later. so, so much happened in since 1990, when they were arrested to 1993, so much happened. So many legal decisions were made. A lot of it was played close to the vest. They hired big time uh, criminal defense attorneys. They had Robert Shapiro at first. A lot of you guys have heard of him. OJ, one of OJ Simpson's lawyer, a deal maker. Then they hired Abrahamson, who is known as more of a trial attorney, a litigator. She had won a couple cases that had similar crimes and similar fact patterns. Rumors are they paid her between seven hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars to represent them back in nineteen ninety. Paid by the family, which is very interesting too that the family was still backing the boys. So a lot happened here in this preparation, but not everybody knew what the boys' defense was going to be when trial started. So go ahead, let's start talking about the first trial. So the trial begins uh, July 20, nineteen ninety three, and like we said, highly publicized. Judge says green light to cameras. We're gonna we're gonna let the world see what's happening here, uh, and so both brothers are going to testify. Uh, no one at this point even knows what the defense is going to be. Everyone knows they did it. Uh, like you said, it's not a question of, of if uh, or how, but the question is why. Uh, and so both brothers testify and it's revealed that they were, uh, or according to their testimony, verbally abused, verbally, physically abused by their parents, uh, especially Jose. And nobody was really expecting that. And nobody had really heard about that before. And there's a lot of interesting problems with that defense because of the fact that nobody had heard about it before at this point in the trial, including the mental health experts that were going to testify that they treated these boys and talked to these boys before. And they even confessed of the crime of shooting their parents and they didn't tell them about the abuse. And now it becomes the centerpiece and the focus of their defense as to why they did this. You guys know I'm always on my health journey and one thing I love as part of my new morning routine is AG1 on an empty stomach. Even before my coffee if I can and sometimes I feel like I don't even need my coffee after. But it's full of prebiotics and probiotics that promote gut health, digestion, and I just love the way it makes me feel after I drink it. I even like the way it tastes. So thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this episode and I wanna encourage anyone interested to start with AG1 and notice the difference for yourself. It's a great first step to investing in your health. And that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with them. Try AG1 and get a free bottle of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash L-Y-K. That's a $48 value for free. If you go to drinkag1.com slash L-Y-K. I hope you'll check it out. So they start to they start to give testimony about this abuse, and we we understand then at, at that point that it's a what I guess is called a battered uh, battered person uh, self defense, an imperfect self defense, uh, also known as I think battered spouse or battered woman in the past. Um, is that the proper terminology for it? So yeah, so. And there's kind of multiple defenses and different defenses between the two kids because Eric was still being abused. Lyle had stopped being abused, but was abused in the past and even also abused Eric um, because Jose abused Lyle, who abused Eric. Lyle's the older brother, Eric's the younger brother. And when Jose allegedly stopped abusing Lyle, he started abusing Eric and Lyle didn't know about it. But when Eric told him, that's kind of what started this plan, among other things, um, to end the lives of their parents. So from Lyle's perspective, it was kind of an imperfect self-defense. From Eric's uh, perspective, it was a battered person syndrome uh, because he was still being battered and he was in fear that uh, Jose, because he had, because Eric, and we're using all these names, but Jose is the dad, Eric is the youngest son, 
because Eric had told Lyle, Jose had threatened to end Eric's life. And so he was doing this in self-defense. That's what Eric was claiming. Lyle was claiming an imperfect self-defense saying that he believed that his life was also in danger, but it was an unreasonable belief. So what is imperfect self-defense is I'm sure what a lot of people are thinking. Imperfect self-defense means you're not not guilty because of what you did. Instead, you are still guilty, but just of a lesser crime. So if first degree murder is on the table and you put an imperfect self-defense forward, which only certain states even recognize this, California was one of them at the time, and I think they still are, uh, but instead of it being first degree murder, it could be a voluntary manslaughter, a lesser included where you're not going to prison for life or looking at the death penalty, which they were looking at at the time. A perfect self-defense or just normal self-defense is a reasonable belief and fear that your life is in danger. An imperfect self-defense is an unreasonable belief. So you do think it in your head, but a reasonable person would know that that's not really what's going to happen. And they knew based on the interaction between Jose and Lyle and the mom and Lyle, that that isn't really going to work for him. So they had to come up with kind of different strategies with the two sons. And um, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but there was two trials going on at this time. We haven't really talked about that yet. That the fact that in this first trial, there's like kind of like two trials going on at the same time, two juries, uh, two separate uh, defense attorneys. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more as well so that we can kind of get the picture of that? So the judge was trying to balance, and we've talked about this in a lot of cases, by the way. Um, the judge was trying to balance the fairness of individual trials with individual evidence. And there was different evidence for each son. Like I just mentioned, one of them was still being abused. One of them wasn't. One of them was currently reasonably feeling threats. One of them was more unreasonably feeling threats. They did different things, said different things. Um, I think Eric had wrote a screenplay with one of his friends in the past about ending the life of his parents. They watched this movie called The Billionaire Boys Club, which talked about ending the life of their parents. So there were kind of different factors and different bad stuff for each of them. And, and as criminal defense attorneys, we don't want the bad stuff of one defendant to color the case of the other defendant and both of them just end up being guilty at the end of the day. So the judge is trying to balance that while also balancing resources and time. We don't want to try this case twice when 90% of the evidence is the same. But if there's an important 10% difference, then we're going to have different juries. So the judge decided to do the trial at once with two juries. There would be certain times when one jury would be sent out or another jury would be sent out when certain arguments are made or certain witnesses are called or certain parts of opening or closing are called. It's kind of confusing, kind of convoluted, but one jury was going to make one decision only on Eric's charges. The other jury was only going to make the decision on Lyle's charges. So it didn't matter if Lyle's jury thought Eric was guilty or if Eric's jury thought Lyle was guilty. They were only making the decision on their individual defendant. It's unusual. It does happen. It's unusual. Sometimes it's difficult, but that's how the first trial happened. And again, you said cameras earlier. I think the judge allowed one camera in the courtroom, if I'm not mistaken, um, or a limited amount of cameras and media coverage because this was all so new. And there was just so much new and different about this case that that first trial was a media circus. You know, we've heard some, you know, these days, Murdaugh, uh, Johnny Depp, Karen Reed. This one was a media circus for its time. And it was brand new and something that people really were not used to. And they became certain celebrities getting all sorts of fan mail, mostly positive during the first trial. And this is one of the things where would it be different today with social media? How would it be portrayed? How would it be clipped? What would happen? Because the tides turned after that first trial, but what else do you want to talk about that happened in the first trial? So, yeah, I mean, like you said to the, from what I understand, one camera, the audio equipment was pretty rough and they even caused some dynamics in, in the midst of oh, yeah. testimony. Yeah. Um, the, 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 even if you go back, so you can actually watch this entire case on, on court first TV trial. on their, yeah, the first trial, uh, you can watch the entire case on their website. Uh, and if you go back and look at it, the footage is just terrible. Like half of it is like blurry and, and staticky and it's just not what we are, what we're familiar with, uh, you know, more or less today. But, um, so you, anyway, you unpacked kind of the, de the defense, uh, the prosecution on the other side, they were they continued to hone in on the spending habits, the potential desire for money. I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> the potential desire for money, that that power, uh, control of the money. And you always talk about how in in any major case like this, a lot of times the the motives tie back to power, sex, money, uh, mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing. It's clearly here is, was very similar. Uh, and so they hone in on that the behavior that happened after the murders took place, the fact that it was premeditated, the fact that they bought these shotguns 
uh, up to a week before the murders took place. Um, that was kind of where the prosecution took their 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 case. Yeah, they were focused on the fact that it was premeditated. They planned it. They wanted to do it. They kind of ignored the defense. I don't think they were really prepared for it. Hmm. So they just focused on all the good facts they had. They had a confession. They had the spending habits afterwards, how happy they were, how you wouldn't do that if you were really distraught. And they had that, you know, they purchased the firearms and they had the um, statements and the Billionaire Boys Club and the screenplay and the testimony of people saying they admitted it. There was all sorts of things that they had in the first trial that they were just focused on their good evidence. They didn't really focus on the defense very much, but very skilled lawyers presented that defense in a very compelling way, especially, I think we should need to take a second to talk about how good from all reports and how believable, especially Lyle's testimony was as to what happened to him and mm -hmm. how brutal it is and how sad it is. And I do think it's important at this point to point out again, the difference in timing. This was happening in the early nineties and how different it was versus today. This is before the Me Too movement. Um, this is boys being molested by their father, which was not a normal occurrence back there. Back then, they still to this day they've done Barbara Walters interviews. They talk about how if they were girls, it would have been very different. People would have been more likely to believe them. But because they were young, strapping, strong men, that they thought they could have fought their dad off or they could have stopped it some way. We know now that this happens a lot more than we knew back in the '90s. Um, so that might be different in how we look about look at that case and how we. Uh, believe victims and try to help victims now versus victim shaming or not believing victims, which I think was more common back then than it is now. Um, of course, there's false allegations. I'm not saying there are not, and those are horrible, but it's just a very different landscape when it comes to abuse like this, especially to boys, um, than it was in the early 90s. And that also goes to one of the explanations as to why they didn't tell anybody, yep. why they didn't claim, uh, complain about this before, and why they were just too afraid or embarrassed or ashamed to let it out and talk about it. So interestingly, the juries, I, I believe at least uh, Lyle's jury, took weeks to deliberate, weeks. 25 days, I think was the exact number. And both verdicts come back unable to, uh, inconclusive, unable to come up Hung with a verdict. Jury. Hung jury, uh, mistrial. Mistrial is declared and- uh, you Which know, is so interesting if you think about it. Both juries, deliberating separately, not knowing what the other jury did, who sat through a very similar trial, because most of the evidence was the same, and they both were unable to reach a verdict. And reports were some people wanted guilty on the highest charge, some people wanted guilty on manslaughter, some people wanted not guilty because of the abuse, but they just couldn't come to a consensus, so mistrial. So all that, a very long and grueling trial, ends up nothing, which kind of feels like a win for the defense, and sometimes the state doesn't pursue charges a second time if something like that happens. Yeah, and so and then this basically is the moment where if you watch the drama on Netflix, the California earthquakes are are kind of uh, taking off at this point, and it kind of symbolizes this shift of the way and the momentum of the trial from from the boys' perspective of uh, if they feel like they have some grounds, they kind of describe the way that it feels like something is shifting against us at this time, uh, and it really does kind of feel like that in the way that the new trial is immediately put into motion. Uh, very quickly, they decide there's gonna be a retrial. Uh, it ends up uh, taking place October, 1995. So um, before we get to the retrial, yeah. first off, imagine how different it would be today with social media. Mm -hmm. And if the tide was turning against them, how much harsher it would have been. They talk about how they got some mean fan mail. In the past, they got only good stuff, but now it's getting bad. And when we go from trial one, to trial two, tons of differences, tons of differences. Starting with no cameras. Uh, the judge ruled no cameras in trial two, uh, taking out the public. Go ahead. No cameras, one jury. They gutted some of their defenses. They gutted some of the evidence they were allowed, they were allowed to bring in. And that's been most of the, the backlash and the unfair claims that I've heard from people saying that trial two was so incredibly unfair. So the same things that had balanced through the first trial, but I'll say the judge had the benefit. It was the same judge of sitting through the two kind of separate juries. And he made the decision that that wasn't necessary for the second trial, that they were going to be tried together with one jury and more differences, different prosecutors, prosecutors that were going to go full bore against this 
quote unquote, abuse excuse now is what they were calling it. And the money had run out on the Menendez side. So uh, Abrahamson decided to stay on. I think she got some public funding or something, but she stayed on pro bono basically, uh, which was Eric's attorney. Technically she was Eric's attorney. Lyle had a different attorney. Lyle's attorney bailed. And so Lyle had to get a public defender who it didn't seem like he was as confident in, although this guy is supposedly very um, qualified and very experienced, but a different attorney and the money had dried up in trial too, which you know what that usually means for the defense, although Abrahamson stayed on. So yeah. a very different trial for trial number two. Uh, you want to talk about how that one went? Well, and also, yeah, um, I don't know if you mentioned that Lyle didn't testify in the second trial. There were some things that happened and whether it was self-inflicted or, or it was ultimately his own choice, I assume, it was the defense's decision to not testify. But but he does not end up testifying for one reason or another. So uh, for one reason or another, it's actually a very important reason. And, <laughs> and it's funny. Yeah. And that, this is kind of like a big part of the podcast I want to talk about because people are screaming about how unfair this was. And generally speaking, again, if this was today, I sound like a broken record. I think some of this may have been different. Um but they were like, like my wife watched this as well. She watched it before I did. Um, and she was like, it's so unfair. How could they not be able to claim abuse? I mean, I do think they're monsters. I do think they did it. I don't know if they're not guilty. It just seems unfair that they weren't allowed to explain the, the abuse. They weren't allowed to have the abuse as a defense in the second trial. Um, I think you had some questions about that too. Like, how is this fair that they took away this defense? Mm -hmm. And when I actually started doing some real research on this, to the real case, not the drama. And I'm wondering if the documentary is going to have more of this in it. It makes a lot more sense legally when you look into what really happened and you don't mm -hmm. look into the over-dramatized or just the clips that you get on social media. And the reports were that one of the reasons Lyle's attorney left and the main reason that Lyle did not testify in trial two is because he had a pen pal who maybe he may or may not have been in love with or thought was going to write his book whom he told that he did so great on the stand, the jury ate it up, basically I'm paraphrasing, and he snowed the jury or pulled one, pulled one over on the jury and they really just ate up everything he was putting down. And all reports are that Lyle crushed testifying and Eric was not as good but was still fine. And so Lyle really carried the day and was the best part of the defense's trial. Well, now, if he were to take the stand they would be able to bring up those recordings whom this girl apparently recorded these conversations and say, huh, Lyle, isn't it funny? Last trial, you said you really snowed the jury with your testimony. And letters came out that Lyle wrote to potential witnesses telling them that they had to testify about X, Y, and Z. So that's not good. And if you take the stand, you can be impeached and they can show you. Did you tell this guy he needed to testify like this, that his dad, that your dad abused him too? Did you testify to this guy that you had told him about the abuse in the past when really you didn't? Did you write these letters basically telling people to lie? So that's why Lyle didn't testify. Very legitimate reasons. And he probably wasn't wrong because he probably would have got destroyed on the stand mm -hmm. with all this impeachment evidence. But then we take the next step. So a lot of this abuse evidence was kept out. Not all of it, first off. Eric was still able to testify to everything that happened to him. All of his allegations he was still able to testify to all of them and anything that he testified to, they were able to argue those as a defense. But if Lyle doesn't testify to something now, you don't have facts to argue. So if he was talking about the mother's abuse and Eric didn't, well, guess what? You're not able to argue the mother's abuse anymore because Lyle never testified to it. So there are no facts in evidence to give you that legal argument. And if there are certain experts that testify to only what Lyle was going to testify about, they can no longer testify because Lyle did not take the stand. Those facts are no longer in evidence. Did the judge go too far? Did he keep too much evidence out? I think there's a discussion to be had about that, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely legitimate when a huge part, when one of the two criminal defendants who was the best witness in the first trial no longer testifies, you're going to have a different trial. You're going to have different evidence that comes in, and the judge was within his legal discretion to keep a lot of stuff out when Lyle decided not to testify. So sorry for that long-winded answer and explanation, but I think it's really important to talk about decisions made by the defense were a big part about why the two trials were different and why not as much was able to come in as in the first trial. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, like you said, in my opinion, not alleged self-inflicted wounds, but legitimate self-inflicted wounds by Lyle. Yeah. Yeah. So then- and That changes your perspective a little bit, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you definitely have to think about, um, I mean, yeah, to, 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 to continue the saying, but um, self-inflicted wounds, like they did it to themselves in, in a lot of senses of that. Um, so before hearing that, what was your thought when you heard like, oh, it's Lyle's not going to testify. Oh, they're not going to let yeah, him I feel like the Lyle. judge just. I felt like the judge just wanted to get it over with quick. Like he was moving quickly and that it was just something that it, it, it did seem unfair. It definitely felt like they were, they were sh turning the tables toward to favor the prosecution. And it, it definitely felt like if that's all you see, uh, it definitely felt unfair. And from your perspective as a layperson, you're thinking to yourself, are you not thinking like maybe they are either not guilty or should have been uh, convicted of a lesser charge because of all that abuse. And it probably would have happened if not for all of this unfair legal stuff that happened to them in the second trial. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Cause that's most of the pushback I've been getting from people is totally unfair. Their rights got trampled on, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying there wasn't some of that and that the judge didn't overreach, but there were definitely some legitimate problems with the second trial because of all the public comments, the letters, the books, and everything they were doing, they were they gave interviews afterwards. They did so many things. And again, in the drama, you hear about how sad it is that the tides have turned against them. But what you don't hear is a book came out. More information came out. People started hearing about why Lyle's not going to testify. And that's, I think, when people stopped believing their story. At least some people, not everybody but at least some people stopped believing their story between the two trials. And there was some comments about after the first trial, then there was OJ and they got a hung jury on Menendez. They lost OJ, meaning the state. So now they were going to make sure they won the second time. And there were some politics behind it and they were going to push the judge and everybody was going to be on their side because they had to get this celebrity win. And that's why everybody was kind of sick of the Menendez brothers the second time around. Yeah. And again, if you watch some of the documentaries on there's, Basically, every, every streaming network has a documentary, Peacock, uh, HBO, they all have a documentary on this. But they talk about, um, again, the cult, pop culture at that time. And, and you're exactly right. People hated them. Like that was it was um, they were they were looked at as monsters. The, the Tonight Show, like shows like that, the hosts were all making fun of it. And they were the butt the butt of a lot of jokes at that time. Um, so they yeah, definitely I mean, they definitely didn't have um, the favor of the country anymore at that point. And. Uh, it, What's Go that? Ahead. Well, you I was going to say, so then the trial ends. Uh, very different story. It's a very quick verdict, just a couple of days of deliberation, and it's guilty. Uh, they get a guilty verdict. Of first degree murder. Correct. Premeditated, intentional planning and ending of the life of your parents, which here's what else I'll say, which I found very interesting. And to all the people watching and listening that watch trials, that comment on them, get into my chat, ask the questions, give their thoughts, which I love and appreciate so much. You guys, the chat that votes so often gets it right. Once or twice, they've guessed wrong on what a verdict is going to be. But I did think it was very interesting exactly how you pointed it out. Trial number one, the world's behind them. And they basically somewhat win, right? It wasn't not guilty, but a hung jury felt like a win for them at the time. Trial two, the world's against them. And it's a quick guilty verdict. And so if you don't think the media matters and you don't think the public matters and the Brian Koberger case where they're talking about prejudgment and how people already know and they've already made up their minds, and they've already read, it matters. And a lot of times it points directly to the outcome of the trial that's coming. And this is a good example of that, the difference between the two trials in the public perception. Do you think that no cameras in the second trial, or do you think that cameras, I guess, would have helped in that sense, like giving people a, a, a clear picture of their defense in the second trial? My opinion of looking back in history and currently, cameras and trial to me enhance fairness. They don't hurt it. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody is on their best behavior when there's cameras or should be. Uh, I think everybody's problems or mistakes or things that happen that are unfair or horrible witnesses or people lying on the stand, maybe even criminal defendants or victims not being honest on the stand, I think it's more obvious and more highlighted with cameras as well. I personally think not having cameras in the courtroom opens you up to the complaints that this second trial got. Not fair, they're hiding stuff, they're railroading these young boys, they're not giving them their defense, as opposed to if there was cameras, and you would have heard that a lot of the facts that came in in trial one didn't come in in trial two, maybe you they would have thought, well, it was a fair trial. So I do think cameras add to the fairness they don't take away. That's my opinion at this point, and I... I 
reserve the right to change my opinion if something happens in the future to change that. Yeah. Uh, the other piece that we haven't talked about yet is that is that I believe this was a death penalty case. Um, it was. So the jury, also the jury with a quick guilty verdict that heard this second case that was much worse than the first case that some people say they got railroaded. They're also going to decide on the death penalty for these two quote unquote monsters. What did they decide? Uh, I don't know how the, I don't know the proper terminology, but they don't, they didn't, they don't get the death penalty uh, they, life, they without, don't like. life without parole. Right. Correct. Which is the win for the defense. Obviously it's not a win. Nobody wants to go to prison for life, but these two boys definitely did not want to get the chamber. So it could have been death. The jury picked life. Why do you think that is? Oof. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it's from the first trial. Like if there's any, any evidence of, um, kind of what they saw, what the jury may have seen in the world at that time or what they may have already known, uh, if anything at all, but I don't know. So I think, and based on some reports, I think it was based on a couple of them thinking, yeah, the abuse probably wasn't true, but if it was, number one, but if it was, and then number two, and feeling bad for them, and number two, their age. I think their age did have something to do with it, um, and you know, California is also known as a more liberal state. They don't even have the death penalty anymore. Um, so from my perspective, I think that that kind of makes sense as well. Yeah. Um, all right. What, what else did you have? So then kind of fast forward to today and over, over the several years, they've been now been in prison for what is it now going on 35 plus years. Yeah. Since uh, 95 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, roughly 30, 35 years. Um, a lot of, as you mentioned, a lot has happened over the last several years. They've done interviews. There's been books that have come out, um, continuous dissension. I think I would describe it as is in terms of people on one side, people on the other side as to who they believe there's not a clear, I think, peace as to the resolution and the way that it ended. Um, and, I think all of that has ultimately, and again, because this was one of the first cases that, um, at least in the first trial, was covered gavel to gavel, there's there's video footage of the entire first trial. And now, present day, you talk about the birth of, of social media and the way in which, um, you know, videos and content goes viral in an instant. Um, it has kind of opened this new door and opened this potential for people to talk about it. For there to be conversations about, you know, happening virtually all across the world about what people think, were they actually guilty, were they actually abused, were some of the situations and stories they described something that you maybe felt? Maybe it's maybe it's something that's happened, um, you know, in, in someone that's seeing this video clip's uh, life. And how does that impact and how does that, that um, content now get talked about again all across the world? And it's reignited this kind of social media movement. Uh, I think they said TikTok has over a billion views and conversations happening about this trial alone. Um, and so there's there is a there is a movement, uh, for lack of a better word, there's a movement happening on social media, and it's in favor of the Menendez brothers. Like it's mostly major majorly. Uh, in favor and in support of their side of the story and believe people that believe they were abused and molested. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, right? And there's a reason it's been reignited. There's a reason people are starting to believe them more because at the time, the big arguments against it were there was no outward expression of it. Nobody knew there were no pictures. There was no bruising. There were no police reports. There was no hospital records, except for, you know, something that was explained by an accident that happened. Um, they didn't tell any of their mental health counselors. Even when they admitted the crime, they didn't tell anybody until they got Abrahamson, who had used this defense successfully in the past. So they probably just made it all up and they weren't abused because little boys don't get abused by their father. That's kind of how everybody looked at this case before because there was not a lot of corroborating evidence. And the people that did corroborate it, which was like a cousin that said that he mentioned it at some point, people kind of, and I mean, you got to understand, like there were legitimate letters of, the Menendez brothers writing letters saying, hey, I need you to testify like this. So lack of credibility was an issue for some of these witnesses, but that's kind of changed now. And some more corroborating evidence, some brand new evidence came out. Yeah, so there's two key pieces of evidence that have come forward 
I think in as recently as the last year, 2023, 2022, um, but pretty recently, uh, two key pieces of evidence. One, uh, Eric Menendez had written a letter, I think it was a few months, a few weeks before the murders to his cousin stating, um, describing the situation that he had been experiencing, that he didn't want to be near his dad. He was afraid of his dad. Um, there were situations that he was, he, he didn't say specifically that he was being but he did say, I'm afraid of what he's going to do to me next. And I'm afraid of, I'm, a, I'm fearful for what will happen. And this is the first kind of like hard evidence, like in writing evidence that we have of something of, of that situation being described prior to the murders. And this was like eight months before. So this was this was a considerable amount of time before. And his allegations were the abuse continued and he told Lyle. So things were ramping up for Eric Menendez. So that would be a huge piece of evidence in the timeline and for the arguments of the defense. So why don't you go ahead and read the letter? So this is Eric Menendez's December 1988 letter to his cousin, Andy. Hello, Andy. How are you doing? I hope better than I am. It's been a long time since we've been in touch. Too long. I wish we could have seen each other during Thanksgiving. We almost did. We were all set to go, and then my parents decided not to go at the last minute. Mom said flights were too expensive. She said we could wait until Christmas. But now they decided that I'm playing in the Fiesta Bowl, and that it's not worth it to fly out just for a few days. I was all excited to see you and some high school buddies, but I'll have to wait a little, I guess. Mom and Dad had a company party here, and Dad hired people to decorate the whole house and bought a house tree that they brought down from Santa Barbara. Actually, they had to bring three down since mom didn't like the way the first one looked. They were pissed. They also decorated the tree. Where's the Christmas spirit in that? I remember when Lyle and I used to decorate it. Times have changed, huh? At least I got to put up my own stocking and one for Rudy and Velvet, who are fine, by the way. Mom isn't doing too great, though. It's like she's here physically, but mentally, she's like gone, if you know what I mean. She freaks out over nothing. I feel bad for her. I don't know why she puts up with dad's ish. At times, I wish I could tell her about things, you know? Someday, especially dad and I. But the way she worships him and tells him everything, I'm so afraid she'll tell him whatever I say. I just couldn't risk it. Lyle got in a huge fight with her over why we couldn't spend Christmas with the rest of the family. And mom freaked out and said if he wanted to go alone, he could. I just don't know why she wants to hurt him like that. Lyle wanted to stay, but dad would not let him. So I'm stuck here alone. I've been trying to avoid dad. It's still happening. And it's getting worse for me now. I can't explain it. He's so overweight that I can't stand to see him. I never know when it's going to happen. And it's driving me crazy. Every night I stay up thinking he might come in. I need to put it out of my mind. I know what you said before, but I'm afraid. You just don't know dad like I do. He's crazy. He's warned me a hundred times about telling anyone, especially Lyle. Am I a serious? Wimpus. I don't know. I'll make it through this. I can handle it, Andy. I need to stop thinking about it. Anyway, I hope you're doing good. How's your new girlfriend, Allison? She seems pretty great. When do I get to meet her? I can see why you don't want to leave Puerto Rico. I hear you're playing a lot of soccer. That's great. I love soccer too, but I had to quit. How many tap-ups can you do? I'm glad to see that school is easy for you. Sounds a little too easy though. Are you learning? Next year's the important year. 11th grade transcripts are what colleges look at. I'm doing okay so far with school. My tennis gets in the way some, but next year is an important year. I think if I really do well for at tennis, maybe dad will ease up some just in time for me to start college at Brown or Berkeley. Anyway, I'm playing great. Really like our new coach, Mark. He beat Lyle 6 nothing the first set they played. It was so bad, Lyle even had to laugh. Well, I'm going to go, buddy. Getting late, and I don't feel well. Keep in touch. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Until then, God bless you, and Merry Christmas. I miss you. Love you. So, so that's piece of evidence number one. That's new evidence that they're trying to use to get a new trial. What else? So piece number two, uh, as we mentioned, Jose Menendez was a music producer in Hollywood. One of the groups that he signed to RCA label uh, was a group out of Puerto Rico, a group of young boys uh, called Menudo. And they kind of like cycle through. Actually, Ricky Martin was a Menudo, uh, whatever star. Um, and so there are these. This it's this musical group of I think five to six boys. One of them has since now come forward. So at the time this was happening in the '90s, these boys were in the mid-teens, 15, 16 years old. Present day, 2023, one of the band members has now come forward, describing the fact that he was also abused by Jose Menendez. Which uh, the is father. obviously huge corroboration because back in the day, they're like, no, not this guy, Jose Menendez. He was such a great guy. He was so successful. Nobody ever complained about anything. And in 1990, boys weren't coming out again, complaining that older men had abused them as often as it happens now and as real of a problem as we noticed that this is now um, because of the research and evidence and because of cases like this even that have put it on the map that come forward and uh, get help. And so now this dude comes forward that was in Menudo and says that this is 
a thing that happened to him at the hands of Jose Menendez. And I don't know why it took him this long. Um, but again, victims of this kind of abuse, they all have their own timeline and we can't really put a timeline on it. It's impossible to understand what they're going through. It's excruciating. But the fact of the matter is he has come forward now. So two major new pieces of evidence they did not have at the time of the second trial. Yeah. The documentary on Peacock goes into this individual's entire story and kind of their background as to why it, they speak to actually why it did take them so long. And, you know, it's a cultural thing, just like, you you know, you said it well, but like, it's, you know, it's just, it was not talked about. It was not something that people were, um, you know, not that it's ever something that's comfortable to talk about, but it's just not um, politically correct to even bring it out. And so, um, but he has come forward now. And again, like I said, that, that, you can you can hear his entire story on the Peacock documentary. It's really really fascinating. Um, so, I guess my question then, and kind of hearing that to you is, knowing that there's new evidence that has come out recently, what does it take for? And, and what is the process, I guess, for this to get reopened, to get this officially kind of relooked at? Whether that's new trial, new sentence, what are the options at this point for for what could happen? So I believe Mark Garagos, who is one of the you know lawyers to the stars, um, is their attorney or one of their attorneys dealing on this dealing with this appellate issue. It's very difficult at this point to get this stuff overturned when it's been this long. It's a jury's verdict. We don't want to overturn a jury's verdict, but this is legitimate new evidence. Um, and one of the questions is, could it have been found at the time? I think there's an argument that it could have, and it would, and it wasn't. But there's a better argument that this is literally prototypical newly discovered evidence. So what they can ask for now is a new trial to overturn the verdict. Um, they could also ask for potentially if the judge overturns it, the state attorney's office to then just charge them with manslaughter, give them time served because they both served 30 years or maybe do 10 more years and work out some kind of deal where they can get out of prison earlier because of this, um, because of this newly discovered evidence. But one of the big problems is to ever win a case like this is would this newly discovered evidence have had an effect on the outcome of the trial? And that's always kind of impossible to know. I mean, sometimes you can say, yeah, no, no way. It's not going to. But in this case, again, with Lyle not testifying, with it being very different than case number one, they made some strategic decisions that you don't get to do take backs he's on and say, oh, well, I mean, I guess you actually could argue that with this evidence, then Lyle would have testified. And if Lyle would have testified, it would have made a difference. And we have proof of that because it made a difference in the first case. But you knew Lyle testifying in the first case helped and you still decided for him not to testify in the second trial. So there's all sort of convoluted arguments, but the real point is they're going to make every attempt to get a new trial based on this new evidence. And I do think this new evidence is important because I do believe all reports are the jury just did not believe the abuse allegations. The abuse quote unquote excuse was just not believed. And I do think that these two pieces of evidence, because you can't say you never told anybody about this. You never told anybody about this fear. That major argument for the state goes away with this letter and the proclivities of the victim as an aggressor or an abuser would potentially be relevant. And this other boy coming out and saying he was also molested, I think would have given a lot of credence to the Menendez brothers. And maybe they wouldn't have had to testify as much. Or maybe Lyle wouldn't have even had to testify if this guy would have testified to talk about the abuse being real and maybe that imperfect self-defense for manslaughter. I mean, from my perspective with this evidence, if you want me to bet on, on, I mean, how I think it would have gone and maybe how I would have voted as a juror, if I'm being completely honest, I don't know how I would have felt sitting there listening to them, but kind of feels more like manslaughter than first degree. If the abuse was real and really happening, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you think, do you think if, um, if more of these band members were to come forward, if there was more, you know, victims, so to speak, of of Jose Menendez that came forward, would that even would that just push the needle even farther? Yes, it would be more newly discovered evidence. Number one, but number two, just like we talked about before, and just like we know, public pressure makes a difference. Hmm. Now, it can also bring not real victims out of the woodwork, which we don't want, and that's a bad thing. Yeah. But if more real victims came forward, absolutely, I think it can make a difference on this case. And you should reach out to Mark Garagos and the lawyers representing the Menendez brothers. Because again, I don't think these guys should get off. I don't think they're not guilty. I don't think they were in fear for their life at that moment and acted in self-defense, um, not in reasonable fear, at least. Maybe they were in unreasonable fear. But I think it's a legitimate case of an imperfect self-defense and this abuse happening 
maybe creating a manslaughter situation versus a first degree murder situation. So just, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier too. Um, you said something about new evidence that's come out. If it could have been, if it could have been found during the trial, uh, it, it's not necessarily new evidence or it's not necessarily looked at as something we could, that could reopen the case. Is that, is that something that's, I guess, a normal practice, I guess. So if I went to, if I got arrested tomorrow, if I go to jail tomorrow, let's say for, for committing murder and six months down the road, let's say, let's say the appeal has already gone, you know, is already, we've already lost appeal. I go to, you know, then six months down the road, a year down the road, new evidence does come out, but it is something, whether that's, you know, someone's testimony or something like that, that could have been found. That's not, that doesn't warrant necessarily. So look at the case. So you're, you're saying it's new evidence. So if it's new evidence, then yes, it's not that it's impossible to find. Okay. It's just that that witness didn't come forward. So there's nothing you could do. You couldn't have forced that witness to come forward. It's more like we downloaded your phone and there was a text message on your phone that we did not use in the first trial. Well, we go back and we actually look at every page and now we're like, oh crap, look at this text message. Yeah. And we're like, here, this text message from John proves that he didn't do it. It's like you had his phone download. It's not our fault you didn't read it. It's not our fault you picked these text messages versus that text message. So that's more of like what not newly discovered evidence is. And it's kind of a gray area and a balancing act and judge's discretion on whether or not you could have or should have been able to find it in the past. Interesting. Interesting. So then I guess last question, just as we kind of wind down, uh, when you think about what's happening here and what we've learned here, and you kind of think about cases that we're also following today, uh, cases like Karen Reed, who's had a mistrial and is about potentially going to get another trial, I guess. How common is it for those two situations, two trials to be so different as they were in this case? It's not common for the trials to be different. For them to be different, something has to happen. And I think the something that happened in this trial was the Menendez brothers getting swept up in the publicity and the celebrity that they found during that first trial. And because of what they did, and again, different world, right? Now we know everything's recorded. Everything is grabbed. The government sees everything, all of our text messages, emails, phone calls. We can just assume everybody's going to get every social media post we ever got. Back then, I think he didn't think anybody was ever going to see, read, or hear what he was saying. And guess what? They did. Actually, so I do have actually one more question. So when you, we talk about obviously the drama that came out on Netflix, it's not a documentary. It's more of a drama. It's Hollywood. It's cinematized. It's high quality. You know, that's one of the things that initially honestly drew me to it as someone who's in production was I liked the production like of it. It was well produced. It was good acting. Um, you have stuff like that. You have documentaries. Uh, at the very least, they're getting people talking. They're getting people um, that are starting conversations and kind of communicating about it. Hey, did you watch this show? what do you think like the actual impact or effects of having something that is more dramatized and, and maybe there's some facts mixed with some perspective mixed with some opinions. Um, and it's put out in the public like that. So I hate it before the trial. Um, and I hate it during a trial. I don't want it to ever affect an actual trial going on afterwards. I think it's kind of fair game. I think it's interesting. I will say I absolutely hated the Netflix drama and in case the people that made it are watching, which I'm sure they're not, not because it wasn't well-produced, not because it wasn't captivating, not because it wasn't engaging, right? All of that, well done. They did their job, good job. I hated it because of the way it made me feel, number one, and the thoughts I have after, you know, being involved in working on real cases like this, covering real cases like this versus watching that and the feelings I had watching that. So let me, let me explain. I also want to explain what I really liked about it, right? But I'm going to start with what I hated about it. And sometimes it's kind of like hard to put my finger on it uh, because we handle so many gruesome, sad cases that are brutal and have, you know, bad stuff happening to kids, horrible monsters involved. Why did this feel so different? It felt so different to me because in my head, I am not sure that the parents, the Menendez parents were monsters. I'm not sure. They're not alive to tell their story and tell their side. And I felt like the depiction showed them as horrible, abusive in every way and negligent parenting and, and totally allowing this and taking part in it basically as far as the mom goes and not doing anything to stop it, knowing it's going on. That's how I felt about them because that was how they were portrayed. And now I don't feel like I can see it differently. I feel like in my mind, they committed every act of abuse that the sons 
claimed and alleged, regardless of if it's true or not, because of the way the drama explained it. They showed the abuse. They showed it happening. We don't know if that actually happened. Now, if we believe the Menendez brothers and the Menudo guy that came out and the letter that came out, and if it's true, okay. But if it's not, now in my head, that's how I picture them and that's how I picture this case. And I hate that. I hate that if it's not true. And I think that's what a lot of people do sometimes when they watch these drama series versus watching the trial, listening to the corroborating evidence, seeing who we think is telling the truth and not, and coming to a legal decision at the end of the day, knowing that our legal decision may not be perfect. It may not be 100%, but it's based on the legal standards and the evidence. This is different. With 100% certainty in my mind, Jose Menendez abused those boys because I watched him do it on this documentary or this drama. And I hate that. I hate that feeling. I hated watching it. I felt horrible inside. And that's probably the type of emotion they wanted to elicit. So they did their job, I get, but I, I personally hated it. What did you think? What did you feel watching? I have some positives that we yeah. can learn and take from it as well. But what, what did you feel and think while you were watching? Yeah, and I, f I know there's a lot of the backlash they've also gotten for that. And I, I, I agree with you. I felt very similarly, I will say. So just my own timeline. <laughs> I watched it. I talked to you a little bit. And I, you know, your opinion actually did make me question, make me wonder, kind of lob the other way. Then as I started watching more of the documentaries, learning more of the other stories, the other stuff, the new evidence that's come out. I was kind of pushed back the other way. Um, but again, one of some of the backlash that Netflix has gotten on the, the drama side of it um, is some of the angles about the way that they make the guys look too, the, the brothers look as well. Right. Um, this, the, the kind of, they have this um, kind of relationship uh, incestual together. kind of uh, alluded to some incestual kind of relationship there that may or may not have actually been reality, but, that's how they're perceived. That's how it's perceived. And they definitely play up that angle throughout it's woven throughout the entire drama. Um, you know, to the point at the end where you're heartbroken because the guys aren't going to the same prison. And the reality is they just committed murder. Why should we I be on their side? I know. Of, I felt uh, it too. I was like, just <laughs> let them just let them be in cells next to each other. Come exactly. on. These poor right. guys, all they have is each other. They're gonna be in prison the rest of their life anyway. No, I I, I did watch a Barbara Walters interview after the conviction and Eric was like, I, I think I'm, I'm getting a lot of things, you know, mixed. And again, that's the other problem with the drama. What's real, what's not versus like what I read actual court documents wise. Um, but he said, he's not a homosexual. I'm pretty sure. And it seemed like pretty confirmed in the drama that he was. And there are reports that there were some stuff with inmates. And again, some of that was in the drama, but there are also some real reports of that. And it's like, is that a big deal in this case? No, but it's just one of those things where it's like, you feel, I felt like, I knew that he was. And then you hear the real him say, I'm not. And it's just those types of things are hard once you watch something and it's in your head, which comes to bias of jurors when they watch this stuff and they read this stuff and they make up their mind. It is so hard to overcome that. And I'm feeling it myself after watching this drama. I, I am feeling it myself. And, and so that's why it's, it's an interesting comment. But let me talk a little bit about what I liked about the documentary from my perspective as a lawyer in this channel and this podcast and what was kind of cool about it. When you're watching, and I'll ask you how you felt, when you're watching specifically Eric Menendez tell his lawyer in a private conversation what happened to him, was that not the most believable part of the whole thing? And how bad did you feel for Eric Menendez at that point? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the intensity of that, I can't remember if I told you, if I was telling you this or someone else, but one of the things that Netflix does, the producers of the show, I should say, do is in that scene, I don't know if you noticed this, but the camera never cuts away. It's one solo shot for like 25, 30 minutes where you are just staring lock eyes with, with him. And you're hearing this unfold and him unpack these details in the story and, and the camera never cuts away. And so you're just left with this, you feel the weight of, you begin to feel the weight of what he's describing and the intensity of that moment. And credit to the actor who who pulled that off because you know he did do a really good job making the audience connect to that emotion that he was conveying in that moment. And it's and, cool for your go ahead. And I was just gonna say, like I said, he did it all like 30 minutes straight, like without any redos and or or you know, do-overs, I guess, in that point. So it's so funny how that's how you look at it from the production side, from what you do. And and to me, it screams when people do not understand how a lawyer believes their client, 
it screams that interaction. If you guys haven't watched it or you already watched it, go back and watch it again. That right there, and, and what else is cool about it, and they, they show the dichotomy, I don't know if they even meant to do this, but how compelling and gripping it was alone with his lawyer in the jail versus how he did not do a good job, problem with the mics, it wasn't great at trial, and people don't understand how sometimes lawyers with every fiber in their belie being believe their clients. And they believe that this happened to them. And we watch it at trial and we're like, we don't believe them or that's not true or blah, blah, blah. Or the lawyer's just doing this for money. That happens. I'm telling you, I know it. I've had it happen to me before where people can't believe my client, but I feel like I know I've had way more conversations with them, more in, in, an, in a setting where there's not other outside sources and they can just be honest and there's no reason for them to lie because they know I'm going to help them. So just tell me the truth and we can get through this and work out whatever we need to work out. And when they tell me, and, and I really believe them, I thought they portrayed that so amazingly well with that scene and the comparison with them um, at trial and sometimes explaining to the audience that's not lawyers, that's how it happens sometimes. And I do believe Abrahamson believed them. And at the end of the day, I would say I probably also believe that they were abused in different ways. I don't know if it was to the extent, I'm sure, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I would guess they maybe played certain things up. They read certain books and saw what played better and dressed a certain way and whatever it may be. But I do believe the abuse happened and one of the and those scenes kind of help add to that. Um, were you gonna say something? Uh the only thing I was gonna add too that um, you know, it's interesting again that you have the perspective you have too, how unfavorable the parents looked at the end of the day. I heard an interview, I think this was on TikTok too, but one of the actors who played uh, I guess it was Lyle, or excuse me, Eric, I think, actually spoke and met with the brothers in prison. Uh, wow. and, and had a conversation with them. And they said and that they, they had seen the Netflix or had heard a lot about it and did not feel that it accurately portrayed the story at all. Um, maybe not at all, but there's there's a lot that they did not Which agree so with. The way that I heard that portrayed. too. Yeah, And it's so interesting to think that even the brothers weren't behind this when that's how I felt after watching it. Right. You know, right. because again, of course, they want this perfect picture to be drawn of them, I'm sure. Um, and the title is Monsters. Right. Um there's so much we weren't able to get to in one hour, but the one other thing that I also liked was uh, the depiction of how the public can turn on you. And when the lawyer, uh, Abrahamson, was interviewing the female jurors, and I think most of the female jurors were on her side uh, after the first trial of the hung jury, and they were kind of talking about what worked, what didn't work, you know, this witness, that witness, you know, this is what we liked, we felt bad for him. And then on the way out, one juror turns to her and says, hey, they probably didn't want to tell you, but while the guys didn't like the brothers and they might not have liked this witness, they hated you. And that female lawyer who's a big shot, probably very confident, very successful, very good at what she did. You could see it crushed her inside. And that happens sometimes. That happens to lawyers. That happens sometimes when you interview jurors, no matter how successful you are, how it can really be crushing and gripping to you. And I thought they did a really good job at portraying that. And those two stories I told about the defense attorney led me to one last real life point that this defense attorney allegedly told one of the experts to remove 20 pages of some or something of records and reports that were damning to the brothers and to their case. And the expert didn't turn those over. And it was a big problem. And I think the second trial that that expert wasn't allowed to either testify at all or to a lot of those portions. And they actually criminally investigated Abrahamson did she destroy evidence? Did she obstruct justice? I don't think any charges ever came from it, but she was all in on this case. She was all in. She believed them and almost seemed like she was ready to stake her career and her reputation on this case. And sometimes that's how that happens and that's real life. And that also affected the second trial. That also affected some of the evidence and experts that again, the people that want to tell you they were railroaded don't want to talk about as much. Did you know about that? No, no. I, I well, only from little bits that you had told me, but um, but I did think that that was a powerful scene as well. You could see the, again the emotion in her, like the devastation when she found out that she might have been the reason why the jury wasn't able to come to a, a not guilty verdict. Um, her personality or her her the way she conducted the courtroom, um, which she had a big personality. She's got big hair. You know, she she presents like that, and yeah, like they might have won if not for her is I is knowing myself 
and the type of pressure I put on myself, that's what I would have heard. Mm -hmm. It's like, regardless of what happened, they didn't like you and they voted guilty or they wanted something bad for your client. It's like, oh crap. And she stayed on, right? Even without pay or with much less pay for round two with all the backlash and all the hate. And you saw it in the courtroom and they pulled clips from it. She was very angry, sarcastic, combative, um, objecting and how she was arguing the case. And she was not happy yeah. um, with, with how it all ended and really felt a certain way about it, which again, as a lawyer, I, I totally understand where she's coming from and it's brutal to watch. So overall, uh, do you feel like this is a case that when comparing it from the 90s to today, do you feel like this is a case that would be very different if it happened in 2024 and why? Absolutely. I think number one, the cultural moment, you know, the way in which our culture today looks at abuse and the seriousness, the weight that which our culture puts on that. And so you talk about a potential jury, the way that they would hear that, I think they look at it with a different lens, uh, with a different mindset in that sense. Um, I can't say that it would be, I don't, you know, I have to think about a little bit more if I think that the the verdict would be different. I do think it would go, I do think the trial would, would, ha, would be very different as well. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest things. Um, you know, you, you, you talk about again, the, the cultural moment in that sense of, um, just people's readiness to talk about it, to, to, to hear it. I mean, the new evidence, you know, if that were coming in today, if this were, you know, if, again, if this trial were happening today with that new evidence, you've got someone that can corroborate the story, uh, and the accusations against Jose. Um, so yeah, I think it would be a very different feeling case. And, and yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think they'd have a lot more evidence if it all happened today too, with cell phone, social media, I have a feeling the Menendez brothers may have been on social media and may have been posting stuff in the moments after, um, the deaths of their parents. But, and I think we might have some more real answers if it happened today. And I definitely think trial number two would have been televised if it was today. So mm -hmm. I will tell you so far, we've done four podcasts, this one more than any other podcast. I cannot wait to read the comments from the chat and from the people listening to the podcast on what you thought about the drama, what you think about this case, what is your perspective? What did it make you think? What did it make you feel? I cannot wait to read it. Um, I'll skip the nasty comments about us, which I'm sure there will be, but I cannot wait to really read and, and think about how you guys think and feel about this case because it was, it was a brutal watch for me. It was just a brutal watch for me. I'm not going to forget it for a long time. I'm ready to move on to another case already. Um, but this one is incredibly interesting. So make sure you guys leave us a review on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, wherever you listen or watch the podcast and make sure you hit the like button on YouTube and subscribe to our channel for John, for Peter. We're out of here till next time. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.